Uh, hey everyone, welcome to today's webinar uh, for your prep for the GRE. Uh, and we're essentially going to be looking at uh, some tips, some ways about thinking about the test uh, that would help you develop an approach to the GRE, regardless of the skill level that you're currently at, regardless of what your target score is. Because at the end of the day, you know, we all have uh, our own specific goals. We all have our own specific strengths and weaknesses, and we're trying to work around them to get to an ideal, uh, you know, result or outcome. So, uh, you know, the advice that we're going to be discussing today, maybe a little bit on the generic side, but they are nonetheless important to consider when you start your prep, as well as if you're in, a, in the last stages of your prep and you're trying to figure out how to make that final push or how to think about the test in the best possible way to boost your score. Um, you know, it's already 7.35, so I think we can just get started. Uh, but before we dive into the content for the day itself, just a couple of uh, ground rules and introduction. So um, we hope to be done by about in about 60 minutes today, right? Uh, ideally, this should be done in an hour. There is the possibility that it could run on a bit longer than that. So maybe you want to keep your schedule open until about nine. I know it's a weekend night. You may have other plans. So, you know, I'm going to try and keep this uh, limited to an hour long, but just warning you in advance. A uh, couple of ground rules. You know, so ideally, we want to make this session as organized as possible. We want to uh, make sure things work in the most convenient possible way. Now, um, if I ask you a question, right, or if I, you know, wait for a response, or there, if there's something that you would like to, uh, you know, put forward to us as a group, you can put it on the chat window. If you have any questions that are specifically just for me, you can put them in the Q&A tab. I know that in the center of your screen, uh, you know, or rather in the center of your dashboard for this uh, you know, Zoom call, uh, you have this raise hand button. However, you know, we just don't use the raise hand button. So you know, I know it's kind of tempting to hit it because it's right in the middle and it seems like the obvious way to you know, sort of get a query answered or something of the sort. But uh, you know, there's like almost 30 of you at this point. So it doesn't really make sense to go about it like that. Uh, ideally, you know, if you have a question of me, you put it on the Q&A tab or on the chat window, right? Um, if you find that there is a lag of over 10 seconds, or I would say even a little bit less than that, 10 seconds is uh, very last decade, isn't it? But okay, um, if you find that there is a little bit of a lag, uh, you know, ping me on the chat window and I will uh, then ask others if they're facing this problem as well. If many of you are facing the problem, it becomes far more likely than that there's something wrong with my connection and I might need to reset it. On the other hand, if you're the only one facing the problem, then it's probably something on your end and I would you know, encourage you then to refresh the window or you know, just close it and open it again. Um, you know what, before we dive in, let's test out your usage of the chat box just so that you know, uh, everything works fine. So if you can hear me and you understood all of the, what I said until now, please type in a one on the chat box. If anything is a little bit unclear or you weren't able to hear me properly, type in two. Cool, Everyone's who sent, everyone who sent in some responses has sent in a one. I think almost like half of you have sent in the responses now, so that's good. That means that it's working, and I'm sure that all of you now have had an opportunity to check out how the chat window works yourself. So that should be, uh, that is a positive, I guess, two birds with one stone there. I uh, just want to reiterate that the raise hand function is not really going to be in use, uh, you know, for for this session. So don't really, you, yeah, you don't need to use the raise hand function. If you have a question, you can put it in on the chat or you can put it in on the Q&A. All right, so uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Matu. Uh, you know, I uh, studied, uh, done both my bachelor's and my master's in economics. Uh, I did my bachelor's uh, at MS University in Baroda. Um, and I did my master's uh, at the University of Amsterdam 
in the Netherlands. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have studied economics for like six years now, but it's, it's something that um, I thought I really wanted to do. But at some point midway through this, I realized that, you know what, what I really like doing is teaching. It's, it's not, not necessarily, uh, you know, economics or finance or, or anything along those lines. So I was all prepped to go to business school. I, I took the CAT, I took the GRE, just thinking, hey, you know, I'm going to get into a university based on these things. And at the last moment, I decided, no, I don't want to go to university. I don't want to go to business school. At least um, I didn't want to take on like an incredible amount of debt. And I realized that, you know, I'd rather just be teaching. I, I, th I find it a lot more fun and it's what I really get up to do. Um, aside from that, however, I do like cricket and football a lot. Um, I really like hip hop music, uh, which makes sense, right? I, I am a verbal faculty and, uh, you know, hip hop is very diverse in the uh, lyrics that are used in terms of the linguistic capabilities of the artists. So something that I enjoy. Um, and I also really enjoy history, philosophy, politics. Um, if you meet me outside of a teacher setting, you'll most f likely find me talking about stuff along these lines. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about, you know, Crack Verbal, right? So uh, you may already be familiar with us to some extent. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But, you know, the point is that we are not just around to help you with your GRE or your GMAT or your whatever standardized test, though that is a big part of what we do. Uh, we consider you know, ourselves mentors to you through your entire journey of deciding where you'd like to go to uni, to doing the tests necessary for it, to sending out the applications all the way until you get accepted and you're ready to go, right? So essentially, you know, um, the decisions that you're going to take are a lot more than can I do well on the GRE or not. That you're going to be thinking about which part of the world do I want to study in? What, uh, how am I going to use my degree to help me get a job? Uh, what is it that I want out of making this career move in the first place? And am I going to be able to achieve it? Uh, you know, we find that many students uh, have a desire to simply, you know, immigrate uh, outside of India and, and that's that's a fairly reasonable uh, you know that's a fairly reasonable desire and that's that's a fairly reasonable uh, you know goal to have but it may not necessarily be right for everyone I, I think that uh, you know I studied in the Netherlands and then I decided that I'd rather come back to India I'd rather come back and live in Bangalore and uh, you know I'm really happy that I made that decision that being said, you could, you know, for the same reasons, you could actually want to go and live in another country. So, you know, it's, it's more than just, am I going to do well on the exam so that I can get in? It's more, how, what am I going to achieve from this? How do I go about it? And how do I make sure that I take on something that I will actually be glad to have done looking back, right? So we have a few, you know, sort of free resources. You can, uh, you know, try out uh, the, the, you know, sort of trial version of our online course at crackbubble.com slash GRE slash online. Uh, we are revamping it. So, you know, if you were to check it out in maybe a couple of months time, you might see a very different course with a lot more material. So that's interesting as well. Um, I could say that because I'm part of the people making the videos and whatnot. So uh, that's, that's the only way I know that. But okay, uh, we do have certain other resources as well. There's videos, uh, webinars, eBooks. So there's our YouTube channel. You may have already seen uh, you know, some videos from there. You may have attended another one of our webinars. We also have certain eBooks and they're all available at crackverbal.com slash free hyphen resources slash GRE. Right, pretty easy to find. All you're looking for is the Crack Verbal free resources and you can check out some of our content. Um, we also have a YouTube channel. So, you know, and in fact, this webinar will be uploaded on YouTube at some point of time. Um, so, you know, you can always check out past webinars, past interactions that we've had, uh, you know, ways to prepare for certain types of questions ways to think about vocab because vocab is a very essential integral part of the GRE and uh, you know other miscellaneous videos about what you'll need to do to do your best for this test. Um, 
we also have some flashcards that you can check out. And I will talk about these a little bit more in detail as we move along. Uh, you know, we've found that they are incredibly helpful uh, for, you know, learning new words because, well, I mean, we know that learning new words is extremely important for the GRE, uh, but we find that these help learn, help students learn new words because they get away from the simplistic approach, which involves rote memorization and uh, something that really helps you understand the context of what it is that you're trying to learn. So, you know, it actually has uh, significance and relevance for you then when you go on to take the test. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly we do have a blog as well and we do post um, updates on it as well as you know little tips about uh, things that you may not always be thinking of at the forefront of your mind when it comes to GRE prep you know like what is it you know what are specific things that you'd want to know if you're retaking the test and you know things that you'd want to like skip over because you already know them but things that maybe you missed the first time around uh, you know how to use a calculator or rather the more pertinent question of you know should you even use the calculator you get the GRE gives you a calculator but is it a good idea to go for it or not um, and even you know what test do you plan to take and why you want to do that test, what do you want to achieve from that test? But all right, you know, enough about the introduction, let's just dive straight into the actual content for today. So I said at the start that we would be discussing sort of 10 major ideas for how to build a study plan, for how to, uh, you know, sort of think about approaching the test as a whole. And like I said, there are, you're all going to have certain ideas about, you know, what kind of score you're targeting, about where you're strong and where you're weak. Uh, you know, how do you get around, uh, you know, dealing with vocab, because vocab is a very important part of the test. Um, you know, and in general, what is the amount of preparation and study that you need to do? Because I'm sure that you've seen, um, you know, people post on forums, you may have heard from friends of study, you know, who'll tell you, hey, I studied three hours a day or four hours a day. And, you know, I really busted my ass for a long time. And maybe at the end of that, they didn't even do as well as they'd have liked. So, you know, there's no denying that, uh, you know, the, the challenge of the GRE is really varied. And, you know, it, it is going to be something that you have to personalize to some extent so that you're dealing with a, a plan that works specifically for you. But in the process of making this plan, there are certain things that you want to consider that are going to be pretty universal, no matter who you are and uh, what your targets are, what your approach is going to be. And the first one of these things is to know yourself. You have to know what your own abilities are. You have to sit down and think about, okay, so what am I good at? What do I suck at? Um, you know, what is, where can I make improvements? What am I really good at, but I can still probably get a lot better at? What am, what do I, what am I not so good at, but maybe I'm going to struggle with this all the way through and it's not necessarily the right place to put in uh, effort. And it goes beyond just sitting and thinking about this, though that is something I absolutely encourage all of you to do. Um, what you'd want to do as well is to maybe try a diagnostic test, maybe try out, um, you know, um, yeah, diagnostic test would be a good idea. Maybe try out a few sample questions. Um, try and understand where you stand before diving into your prep, right? In fact, all too often we get people to tell us, um, you know, um, I've started my prep, but I wanted to like, you know, do a whole bunch of verbal and quant questions and concepts first. Then only I want to take a practice test because I feel like I'm not going to be, you know, do well on the practice test if I take it at the start. But you know what? That's kind of the point. It's okay to take a practice test straight up and not do very well. The purpose of, you know, doing that diagnostic or the purpose of starting out by taking a test is to give yourself a sense of where you stand right now. It's not to say that if you did poorly, that reflects in any way on your record. In fact, a large part of doing well on standardized tests is simply understanding standardized tests, which we will get to in point two. 
but before you you know get to do well on standard before you get to understand the standardized test what you do have to understand is that you are going to start out as an amateur you're going to start out not necessarily knowing everything that you need to know and that's fine that's absolutely okay you will maybe not get the best score but it will tell you where you can improve so let's say you do the test the first time around and you get like a 290 right that's that's not a particularly great score let's say you get like a, a 150 in quant and a 140 in verbal and then you realize okay well i didn't do very well but areas that i did particularly badly on were probability um sorry one second yeah were uh probability uh or you know in my vocab or reading comprehension and now based on that knowledge you can actually take steps in a more positive direction so that you know you uh, can get the kind of improvement that you need if you focus on what you're already good at you're unlikely to make that same kind of jump or that same kind of boost right so you have to start out by knowing yourself and understanding where you currently stand in terms of your prep if you've already started your prep it is still a good time to take a diagnostic just to know where you stand just to know what your future direction of prep should be moving forward. All right, the next point is, of course, to know the test. Now, you know, um, imagine for a second that uh, you have suddenly been drafted into, uh, you know, like a, a fighting tournament, right? And you're going to wrestle with, uh, you know, a, a champion, right? Or let's say you're going to box against. Uh, Mayweather, right? Because he's he's done like you know incredible things. He's gone undefeated, right? So so you're going to box against Floyd Mayweather, and that's that's a difficult battle. That's obviously a difficult battle. It's, it's the guy's never been defeated. Now, you really have two options, right? Aside from like giving up straight away, but you really have two options. One is that you know you train nonstop for like 15 hours a day, and you somehow try to get up to his level, which I'm not going to say that that's absolutely not possible, but it's difficult and unlikely. Uh, but, you know, you're still going to have to train somewhat. Or you can focus on trying to understand Mayweather himself. Is he a righty or a lefty? Does he tend to punch towards the, towards the face or to the shoulders or to the midriff? Where, where, do, what, where does this guy move? What, is he, uh, you know, is he weaker or less agile on one side of his body than the other? All of this knowledge is just as useful in helping you to do well as improving your own ability. It's obviously important to try and learn as many words as possible. But if you understand that the GRE tends to test words that describe things, then you know that you're going to get more purchase out of learning words that describe things. Right? So that's just a, a simple example on that front. But essentially, every piece of information that you have about the test will help you become better at understanding what you need to do in order to ace the test. Right? Uh, for those of you who are just starting out, some useful information for you would be that, uh, you know, at least on the verbal section, reading comprehension makes up about 40 to 50%. So if you have 20 questions on a section, you're looking at like eight to 10 reading comprehension questions. If you know, you're looking at um, you know, five to six text completion questions, four to five sentence equivalence questions, and you know, uh, maybe two, but it's also likely that you get one or even zero critical reasoning questions. Now, if you're absolutely brand new to the GRE and you're hearing these terms for the first time and you're thinking, well, what the hell is sentence equivalence anyway, right? Well, now you have a question. Now you have a good place to start. You find out what these question types are. You find out what the structure and the format of the test is. You need to have clarity on every aspect of how the test is set up, right? To give you a few basic pointers, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, each section on the GRE has 20 questions uh, other than the essay section, but that's kind of irrelevant to your, uh, to, you know, the overall score that you're going to get. Uh, but yeah, so you, you have 20 questions in a section 
and you're going to have either three verbal sections and two quant sections or three quant sections and two verbal. Two of each count. One is experimental, but you can't know which one is experimental, so you can't just phone that one in. Now you know a little bit more about what the test is to entail. You know that you're going to get 20 questions at a time. You're never going to have to really, you know, build up your concentration to do more than a block of 20 questions. So now, what's the point in sitting at, at a table for four hours constantly doing questions? You know, it's not going to help you, right? So understanding what the test is set up as is going to help you figure out what you need to do in building a plan towards, you know, doing as best as you can. Um, all right, I'm going to pause for a second, right? Uh, if you have questions at this stage, please send them in on the Q&A or in the chat window. I do see that I've already gotten a question. So how this will go about, how, how this will go down is that I'll take questions at, you know, sort of regular intervals or I'll stop to take in the questions that have come up in that period of time. And, uh, you know, once they're answered, I'll move on. Okay, so the question that's been asked is, is the AWA uh, mandatory to get admission into US colleges? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the AWA is, it is essentially the essay section. It stands for analytical writing assessment, which is again, just fancy jargon for saying, uh, you know, it's the essay section of the GRE. Uh, it has a separate score. So, you know, how you do in the verbal and quant sections doesn't impact this and this doesn't impact your overall score. So you get a separate score from zero to six. And most universities don't see it as supremely important, but you can't absolutely tank it. You know, if you, if you do well on your GRE score out of 340, uh, but you get like an AWA score of like one out of six, people are gonna ask questions. So I won't say that, you know, the AWA is getting like a high AWA score is mandatory but you do have to get write something that is at least a passable essay. So, you know, at least somewhat sound grammar and, you know, ideas that show that you've thought about, you know, the topic a little bit and not just, you know, um, try to pre-prepare something, you know, it's, it's essential that you just write with your own fluency and agency, right? So that's, that's something that you want to keep in mind. Um, Another question's come in, which says, I have the GRE on the 20th of August. I'm still struggling with a few math questions and in verbal, I'm pretty okay. Am I screwed? Uh, good question. Uh, I would say that you are less screwed than if you were in the opposite camp. Um, generally, you know, just based on the nature of how these admissions work, uh, students who apply from Asia tend to have uh, you know, math scores that, that tend to be higher than average and verbal scores that tend to be lower than average. Um, if you actually have it the other way around, it uh, demonstrates, you know, a certain degree of, like you're, you're different to the people who are usually applying. And uh, as much as possible, uh, you know, universities love having a diverse set of thinkers on board. And when we say diverse, I mean, you know, we talk about diversity from the point of view of, oh, you know, does that mean that more people from outside the US are going to get in and all of that. But, you know, the diversity that I'm referring to here is uh, diversity of thought. So there's a, uh, you know, there, 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 there's a, di there are people who have had different lived experiences that have resulted in you know, their abilities being, their strengths as well as their weaknesses being different. So I would say that, you know, if your worry at this point is in the quant section, that is a nicer place to be than if your worry is on the verbal section. Of course, you still want to practice quant. You still want to make sure that you have that locked down. But I'd say that, you know, don't take, don't stress out unnecessarily. Um, okay, so a couple more questions right, that have come in and, and then I'll continue to move forward. So somebody has asked minimum score on AWAs. Now, this is something that you would have to check with your university. Every university doesn't have the same, uh, you know, uh, cutoff, right? Some of them might say we want a four. Some of them might say we want a two. Some of them might not even say anything, but they wouldn't be happy if you got a one or a two. So it's probably something that your best 
of asking and confirming with your university. But regardless, I think that, you know, it is worth spending a couple of days just thinking about what you need to do to do well on the AWA so that, you know, this doesn't become as much of a problem down the line. And I don't particularly write, like writing the AWA myself. And, uh, you know, when I took the GRE, uh, I got a 336, but I just got a four on the AWA, which is, it kind of skews down, right, from, from the, the score that I got as a whole. But universities didn't seem to care because it was above a certain threshold. Now, I can't say that that would necessarily happen if you have like a one or a two. So, you know, check with your university. That's the best advice that I can give you. Um, final question before we continue on. Can you please suggest any good book on probability? Now, I believe that uh, Manhattan GMAT has some good, uh, you know, testing questions on probability. But if I'm being very honest, I am not the best person to ask this question, right? This is my suggestion. But this is my suggestion as somebody who is almost on the same level as you. You know, I, I would be a student or, you know, somewhere about there when it comes to uh, you know, the quant section of the GRE. My expertise is certainly, you know, far more uh, tweaked towards the verbal side. However, check out MGMAT. I think they have some pretty good questions at least, and, and that's a good test. All right, let's move on. So now we spoke about knowing yourself and knowing the test. Now, and, and, and it, is, it was heavily implied that knowing yourself and knowing the test lead to some benefit. You're not just doing it for the sake of doing it. You're not just doing it for some kind of philosophical introspection. You, uh, you're trying to use that knowledge to help you achieve some kind of goal, right? And, and what, so what are you trying to really do with it? You're trying to gain this information so that you learn about every possible hack, every possible exploit, every possible sort of trick in the book that you can use to help boost your score. Now, let's think about what this means, right? So a good example here would be that uh, the GRE is an extremely user-friendly test, all right? So there, there are some really nice things about the GRE. Uh, and, you know, if you take a look at this image here, right, it, it shows you that you can mark questions you can mark questions that you have answered. You can mark questions that you have not answered. You can choose to skip a question and then come back to it later so long as you have time in that section. So in a sample verbal section, you would have 30 minutes to do 20 questions. You can do 15 of them and then come back to the ones that you didn't do at the start so long as you have, you know, still, so long as you still have time from that 30 minutes left. Uh, this is really nice. A lot of tests do not give you this ability. On the GMAT, for example, which is another test that we teach, you absolutely can't do this. You can't go back and change any of your answers. You can't go back and answer a question that you had previously skipped. Um, on the CAT, you can kind of do this, but there are so many questions that it's difficult to remember exactly which questions you want to go back to. And you know, the process for doing so is a lot more mentally taxing. So, you know, on the face of things, it looks like the GRE is a really nice user-friendly test. You know, it's, it's very convenient and it's designed in favor of you as opposed to trying to give you some complicated exam pattern that will, uh, you know, lead to confusion on your part. Um, that being said, the GRE being a user-friendly test is only useful in the circumstances that you're actually able to make use of this information, right? So uh, all of the GREs being user-friendly is of no good if you don't actually use it to skip questions when you're having a hard time. If you don't actually mark questions when you feel like you're a little bit unsure about the answer. If you don't use these tools given to you, then you're automatically putting yourself at a disadvantage. So, you know, you could say, oh, wow, the GRE is so benevolent. But a more pragmatic way of thinking about this is, well, they've given me these tools. I better learn how to use them or else I'm going to fall behind the crowd or else I'm going to fall behind. And the people who do know how to make use of these tools will do better. So it's very important to consider every possible exploit, right? Uh, 
of course, you know, the, we've just discussed being able to skip questions, being able to mark questions, being able to come back to questions later on. All of that's very useful. But I would say the most significant thing on this front is that there is no negative marking on the GRE, right? There's no negative marking. There's no guessing penalty, right? So to speak, if you get a question wrong, and if you don't answer a question, they'll be treated in exactly the same way. Now, on the one hand, you can say, oh, that's really nice. But really what you should be saying as a result of this is that, oh, wow, I, I really cannot leave any question blank. I need to answer every question, right? Even if I'm taking a guess, I should go ahead and take that guess, right? Even if I have a one in 10 chance of getting this question correct. Well, if there are 10 questions on which I, I, I'm not so sure, I'll probably get one of those right because I've, you know, I have this one in 10 chance. And there's nothing that goes wrong for not getting it right. So you absolutely must guess, you know? And I, I can't stress this enough because I didn't know this. So I left a couple of questions um, on the verbal section because I wasn't sure. I thought, okay, you know, I don't really know the answer. Should I even go for it or not? I wasn't sure at all. So I didn't guess. And that may have hurt my score. Who knows? It didn't turn out to be that unlucky for me in the end because, you know, my score wasn't too bad, but it could have an impact, right? So you've got to make sure that you answer every single question. And you know what this means? This means that it doesn't just mean, you know, okay, in the practice test, I'll answer all the questions or, you know, when I'm solving a question, let me try and answer. It means that you want to think, you want to get acquainted and comfortable with guessing. It's very important to become comfortable with guessing. I know that some of you hate guessing. And I know that because that's a totally natural impulse. You know, you feel like, I don't really know the answer. Why am I going ahead and, and picking something anyway? You have to get comfortable with doing so because the test demands it. The test expects you to be guessing on some level. All right. Now, the next thing that you have to think about when it comes to you know, building a study plan is that you need to have a proper time management strategy in place. One of the most difficult things about the GRE is making sure that you can actually finish the 20 questions in 30 minutes or in 35 minutes, you know, if we're talking about the quant sections. Right? That, and it's something that may not always be super easy to do. Now, on top of this, at least in the verbal section, and I can say this is kind of true for some of the quant questions as well, uh, but you know, certainly very, very starkly true in the verbal section that you know, there are 20 questions, but you can't just say 30 minutes, 20 questions, 1.5 minutes per question. It's not as simple as that because there are like multiple types of questions as we saw earlier, and they don't all take the same amount of time. Reading comprehension takes much longer than something like sentence equivalence because when you're doing reading comprehension, you actually have to read the passage. You have an entire passage to read and only then can you answer the questions on it. So that means that you can't say, okay, that's going to take me 1.5 minutes as well because it's very difficult to do it in that amount of time. Uh, something like sentence equivalence, you're literally just reading a sentence which has one blank and you're thinking about two words that can fit that blank. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. It's very difficult, especially because of the kinds of words that you get. But this should not really be taking you more than a minute, right? And you need to do it that quickly or else you won't have time to solve reading comprehension questions. In the same way, right, the kinds of questions that require a numerical response on the quant front are obviously going to take you a little bit more time than the ones that are simple uh, multiple choice questions because you actually have to come to an exact answer rather than just trying to eliminate already existing bad answers. So ultimately you wanna make sure that uh, you, know, you have a strategy that incorporates being able to manage time effectively. Now, how do you do this, right? Ideally, sentence equivalence and text completion should take you about 10 minutes, so about one minute per question there. And RC and CR questions, of which again, they're about half, half the test, should take you about two minutes per question or 20 minutes. Now, what this means is that again, when you're practicing on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to become familiar with answering questions in this pattern. There's no point in doing an RC passage as preparation and just sitting and solving the passage without a timer. 
because the process of solving a passage with a timer and without a timer are two totally different things. And if you solve a passage without a timer, you're training yourself to solve a passage without a timer. That's not what you need to be training yourself to do. Know the test and use the knowledge of the test to beat the test. The test expects you to be able to solve questions at a certain speed. You need to do your practice at that speed as well. So always set yourself timers. If you're going to do, say, three RC passages and they come up to like eight questions, set yourself a 16-minute timer and then dive in. Right? That's how you've got to do your prep on a day-to-day -day basis as well. All right, I'm going to take some more questions because I see a few more have come in now. So the first one says, I'm doing well in practicing questions in both quant and verbal, but when I'm writing a mock test, I'm unable to manage my time during verbal. Oh, that's not really a question, but I guess the thing that you want to think about then is that maybe when you were doing your preparation, you weren't really putting timers and you need to put timers always. If there's no point in being able to solve a question, if you cannot solve it at the speed that the GRE expects you to solve it at, right? So that's something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, can you please tell the best way to prepare for the GRE for both quant and verbal? That's kind of what we're discussing right now. It's the, the approach that you need to take, the way that you have to think about the test in order to make sure that you have the right strategy in place. Ultimately, I could tell you study X amount of hours, but that's certainly going to be false for some of you and, uh, because it's too few and false for some of you because it's too many. Rather than trying to come to do X, do Y, do Z, do A, you really want to have a sense of, well, what is it that I want to get my head around? Right? So if we had to boil what we've discussed so far into a couple of tips, it would be that you have to practice questions with a timer, right? And you have to have, uh, you have to practice questions with a view towards guessing. You have to practice questions with a view towards expecting to almost guess at some stage if you feel like you don't, that you're not going to get to the answer. You have to become comfortable answering questions in the manner that you would on testing. Uh, another question that has come in says, I am uh, planning to take, um, I'm planning to take the GRE in September. Where should I exactly start in preparing verbal? I don't know much vocabulary yet. How can I prepare smart and learning the verbal section to score more? So I would say that to start with, you do need to, uh, you know, start with a cohesive plan for your vocab and we will discuss vocab uh, you know, in a couple of minutes, right, moving forward. Uh, so we'll get to that more specifically. But in general, you do want to start by, you know, maybe signing up for a course and, uh, you know, working through the content, right, working through the conceptual matter. You want to become familiar with the conceptual matter so that you at least know the scale of the challenge in front of you. Right. And learning the conceptual matter is not very hard. It's, it's something that can be done in a matter of like a week or so. Right. At least becoming familiar with the techniques, applying those techniques on questions. That's a big, that's a bigger challenge. Right? And that's going to be the bulk of what you're going to do. But familiarizing yourself with the nature of what you're trying to do. Not that hard. Right. And that's something that you can definitely get started with if you get started with the course. Um, final question on the Q&A tab and then I'll move to the chat tab. Uh, I'm taking so much time during the verbal section that affects me during the test, right? So that's, that's what I said, right? You have to do your, even your day-to-day -day practice has to be with a timer. There's no point in saying I'm doing well without the timer and I do bad once the timer, I do poorly once the timer, uh, you know, comes into play because, well, you weren't preparing in the manner that requires you to, you know, study effectively for the GRE, right? So, Make sure that moving forward, you practice all your questions, not just tests, using a timer. All right, so let's move now to the chat tab. All right, as far as guessing is concerned, you need to be crafty. Is there some sort of strategy that you can apply while guessing? So the obvious way to go about this is process of elimination, right? It, you, there is, a, you know, you're not trying to guess in a manner that, you know, uh, gets into the psyche of how uh, GRE options are arranged or set up. You can't really account for that. And that is totally randomly done. What you can do on the other hand, is you can start by eliminating the improbable answers so that the only answers left are the ones that you might be a little bit confused by. Remember that every answer you eliminate, every wrong answer that you eliminate, increases your probability 
by a more significant amount than the previous eliminating the previous answer did. Right? Like if you have five options, that's a 20% chance of getting it right. Uh, you eliminate one, it goes up to 25. You eliminate two, it goes all the way up then to 33. And you eliminate three and it goes all the way up then to 50. Right? So that's like you're really trying to use process of elimination and accepting that you probably are going to be guessing on a few questions. Right? If you know the answer to half the questions and for the other half of the questions you guess, and let's say you only eliminate two options and then you guess, right? Or most of the guesses that you're making have like say a one in three chance or thereabouts. So, so then you get another three out of 10. And if you can get all that way, the, the difference between getting 10 out of 20 per section and getting 13 out of 20 per section, that's like 10 points. That's like an incredible, like that's, that's the difference between getting like a 152 and a 160 in verbal. That's like the difference between getting like a 155 and a 163 in quant, you know, so eight points or so, not 10, but that's a huge jump. That's an incredible jump that you can gain by guessing. So it's about being comfortable with large, the law of large numbers. You may not get this one question that you've guessed correct, but you are going to guess more than one question on the test. And if you trust that you keep guessing, you will get some of those guesses right. Um, could you please suggest the books that you used for verbal? If I'm being very honest with you, I was an incredibly lazy student and I did not really prepare very much for the GRE. That, that, I know that sounds like terrible advice, but, but to be very honest, you know, I didn't get too far. I, I looked up the concepts, right? I looked up, you know, what were the types of questions and you know, how, how I'd be tested on them. Uh, and I did have, I, I have, you know, done things in the past to help improve my vocab. And we will discuss that down the line. So I guess that's really, you know, useful books will come up along those lines. But really, you know, what, what I would say is this, that the, ultimately the concepts behind answering questions on the GRE are not the hardest ones in the world. You know, it's, it's, it's a matter of learning to apply them to questions that are a bit more challenging. And that's really the part that's harder. So I would say that above all else, what you want to do is practice questions. What you want to do is, uh, you know, analyze the question that you're practiced to understand where you are going wrong and what you want to change there. Um, all right. I gave the ETS official sample paper and I want to know how similar it is to the actual test. In terms of format and even difficulty to some extent, they're very, very similar. But I would say that on the whole, uh, mock tests are not the best predictors of your actual score. So, you know, I won't say, I won't jump in and say immediately that, hey, that's what you're probably going to get on the actual test as well. Maybe a plus minus five is a good idea, you know, to, to, to tack onto that. There are also other factors that play into this, you know, like taking a test in the test conditions may have a different approach to uh, have a different impact on you as opposed to taking a test, uh, you know, in the comfort of your own home. Uh, I say comfort, but like as somebody with uh, borderline ADHD, I actually like taking the test at a test center. It, it, it's like putting on blinders, you know, it forces you to concentrate only on what's in front of you. So, you know, for me, that's a benefit. But for many of you, that might be harder, you know, that you're not in a comfortable environment, you know, you might prefer to be like, you know, sitting on your bed, right, while you take a test, and you may not get to do that, then, right. So that it really is a little bit variable based on these external factors as well. But in terms of difficulty, the questions are very similar. Um, can you please suggest books? We already went over that. Is there any count of words that's mandatory for GRE verbal? We will talk about this moving forward. I think it's a good question. I do want to get, get to that. Uh, I'm not confident with my answer is correct or not in RC. Okay, so essentially, you know, what, uh, what you want to do when you're practicing literally any type of question, this is not just specifically the case for RC. If you feel a little bit unconfident, right, you're going to have to look at the answers later on and you, you'll find out that you got some of these questions right and some wrong, obviously. For the questions that you've gotten wrong, you want to try to understand what you did in order to get this question wrong. So you want to understand what was the thing that you did in your prep that led you to that answer and take that away so that you don't repeat that mistake. That's essentially what you're trying to get a sense of. Um, 
what is the average score GRE score for a good B school? Uh, again, good, right? Uh, definition of good is, is, is certainly subjective. But if we're talking about one of the top 50 B schools in the world, you're looking at a score of uh, anywhere from like 322 to 328 or so. Uh, but that's the people who get admitted. Generally, if you're at a 325, no university is going to not admit you because your GRE score was low. So what I mean by that is that like, if you apply to Harvard with a 325 and they reject you, and then you come back again the next year and you apply with a 340, they're not suddenly going to accept you. Your pro, like the thing, the reason that they rejected you had something else to do uh, with your profile, right? It was not, not to do with your score itself. So really, you know, if you're at like a 325, no one's really going to, you know, not admit you for that reason, right? Let's move on a bit because, you know, we are uh, starting to run down on time and we're, you know, barely half of the way through. All right. So um, approach questions with a view to eliminate and guess when you get as far as possible. We kind of touched upon this already, right? We, we, you know, a lot of these things, you start to see how they're linked to each other and how your understanding of the test affects how you take the test and that and that understanding is linked to elimination, is linked to intelligent guessing. Uh, one of the other things about you know, why you should look to guess and why you should look to eliminate as well, why elimination in particular is the best way to go forward, is that you, know, you can ask why the right answer is, is right. And you know, at least on quant, you're sometimes going to get a reason, right? You're going to get like a, a specific set of uh, algorithmic steps that would lead you to one specific correct answer. But on the verbal section, this is often not the case. Uh, you know, you might have to fill in, you know, is this word right for the blank? And the thing is, you can't say what objectively the best two words for any given blank are, or what is the best word to fit into any situation. You just can't, right? Um, there is no such thing. So why is whichever word that was the correct answer, why was it correct? It was correct only because the other words were wrong. So rather than trying to look for one right answer, you're trying to look for four or six or whatever many number of wrong answers, right? You don't want to just look for the right answer. In fact, that's the wrong way to go about it. You want to start by identifying answers that are very obviously wrong and then identify answers that are more subtly wrong and then you can maybe get to what the answer is. This is a much more effective technique because of, you know, because of what we just discussed, as well as because you know, there's no negative marking. The, GMA, the GRE expects you to guess because if there's no guessing penalty, then it means that, they assume, that they're assuming that you're going to guess when you don't know the answer and that you might get a question or two right just by guessing. So you're expected to guess somewhat, right? What's essential is that you have to get rid of the idea that this is unethical or that this is flawed or this is just like, you know, like a cheap hack. It's not a cheap hack. Intelligent guessing demonstrates that you know something about a question, right? The fact that you eliminated, let's say you had five options and you eliminated three of them. The fact that you eliminated three means that you, you know that it's not those. You know something about this question. And if you do this on a consistent basis, if there are six questions for which you come down to two options and guess, you're probably going to get two or three right. That, that means that you, know, you should be rewarded for that. You're able to exploit the way that the exam is set up. You're able to recognize that from these 20 questions, you're not going to know the answers to all 20. In fact, you're probably not even going to know the answers to like 18 questions. So you're definitely going to guess three or more questions. And by guessing intelligently, you can make sure that you can boost your score by at least a couple of points on every single section that you do. The next point, of course, is that it is to do with vocabulary, all right? And in fact, the next, uh, I think three or four points are all to do with vocabulary. And I think that, you know, this is a thing that we touched upon. Now, let's first address the question that was asked, right? How many words is the mandatory minimum? Now, when we talk about the number of words that you need to learn, um, there is no mandatory minimum number of words. All right. Now, I know that's, that's going to sound weird, but the point is that you could learn 200 words and it could be enough. But you could learn like 80 words and it could be enough. And you could learn like 3,000 words and you may still find that it doesn't really impact 
like you the words that came up on the test just happen to be different words you know there are words that are more commonly tested on the GRE and I'm sure that you know different companies or different sources have tried to sell this to you as hey here are a bunch of GRE words and the thing is they're not they're not entirely wrong they're not they're not wrong they, these words are more likely to appear on the GRE than certain other words but the thing is that that the GRE isn't picking from a selection and only putting those words out there they're using whatever words they can. It's just that by the nature of how the English language works, there are some words that are just very descriptive in nature and very clearly indicate whether the connotation is positive or negative. And, you know, those are useful things. Those are words that they can actually then make you play a guessing game with. So that's why those are words that tend to be tested a little bit more often. So, you know, when we talk about a number of words to learn, I would say that, you know, no amount is too little, but at the same time, no amount is too much. So you always want to be trying to learn vocabulary. You want to make, you want to just learn vocabulary as much as is possible. But when I say as much as is possible, I mean, like, if you can dedicate half an hour to 45 minutes a day, that's really good. That, that like, like there, there's no point in telling yourself, I'm going to sit and learn a list of words uh, endlessly for like three or four hours because one, you know, you're going to have burnout. Two, that's not the right way to learn words. You're not actually going to learn. You're not going to be asked what the definition of a word is. You're going to be asked how a word fits in a sentence. And, and to get at how a word fits in a sentence, you don't need to know what the word is defined as, but rather what the vibe of the word is, right? What the word, you know, where you would use it in a sentence, what is it trying to communicate? Is it trying to say something that's more positive or negative? Is it trying to describe the cleanliness of something or is it trying to describe the uh, vibrancy of something or the aggressiveness of something? It's, it's, it's what vibe a word gives off, right? Is it a very strong word or a mild word, right? It's stuff like that that you really want to be able to think about. And that stuff doesn't really come through from the definitions. So really, the best way to learn new words is to learn them through learning their roots, right? So let's take a look at, you know, some roots on this front, right? So if we take, for example, cron, okay? So uh, you know what? Let's actually fill that out with a little bit more information. Uh, chronos is the Greek... Oh, that's automatically, like, mildly political. Uh, you know what? I will go with my conscience and not capitalize the word God, but okay, let's say Kronos is the Greek God of time. Okay, so because of this origin, we now in English have words that have Kron in it, C-H-R-O-N, tend to be words that have something to do with time. When we talk about something that happens chronologically, it's the order, the order across the dimension of time in which things happen, right? It's telling you what happened first, what happened next, what happened next, and so on. When we talk about diseases being chronic, it means that these are diseases that have affected you for a long period of time. They're diseases or they are, uh, you know, afflictions that you have over a period. It's not something that you suddenly fell sick with. Um, to use a less, you know, sort of PG example, uh, you know, there's a, a, pop, a strain of marijuana that is uh, popularized in a lot of hip hop music called the chronic. And the chronic is a, is, is a strain of marijuana that's called so because its effects last for a very long time. So, you know, you could, you could see examples of this root everywhere. When we chronicle something, we record the process by which something happened. We record how something happened across a period of time. Uh, a chronograph. So let's take a guess at that. Now, when we hear graph, that usually refers to like measuring or tabulating or you know putting something on a, on a graph, right? Like it's, it's measuring. So what is a chronograph? Something that measures time. Another word for a chronograph is simply a watch. So there you go, right? Now that's, that's a fancy word for watch, chronograph. But just by understanding one root word, you now know what this word means along with a bunch of other words. Something that happens synchronously is things that happen synchronously are happening at the same time. Things that happen anachronously are happening at very different times. Let's come back to synchronous. 
So if synchronous, we kind of know that things syncing up are things that happen at the same time or coming together. So this now means that sin has something to do with same because if chronos is to do with time, this is to do with same. Can we think of some other words with S-Y-N that also have something to do with same? Absolutely, we have synonym, right? The word synonym is simply words that have the same meaning. So now we have a sense that, you know, when you learn words through their roots, there are really three advantages to doing so. The first one is speed. You will learn words so much quicker because when you learn one root word, you can learn like five new words. That's automatically a benefit, right? That's, that's a great advantage. It'll help you learn words in the quickest possible way. Um, the second advantage is that you may have partial knowledge of, of what a word is, and that can still help you lead yourself to the right answer. You may not have known that a chronograph is something that measures time, or you may not make that connection for the second part. But you might have remembered chrono, and you might be like, oh, this is something to do with time. But the word that you're actually looking to fill in the blank might have nothing to do with time at all. And then you realize that, hey, okay, you know, it's probably not going to be chronograph. So even that partial knowledge of a word can help you decide in part whether to eliminate or whether to keep it. Right? And that's another benefit. Um, Lastly, the reason why you want to learn words to their roots is the connections, right? So we went from cron to synchronous, then to words with sin, with this S-Y-N. Uh, and in doing so, the advantage that we have is that we learned the words the way that a child actually learns words. We learn words by making neural network connections between the words and the ideas that we learn. Learning words of a list is not how we learned words as a kid, right? It's not how a human acquires language. We acquire language by making a web of connections, by making this giant neural web of connections, you know, with our synapses just hitting off and, and you know, connecting ideas to things that we already have a sense of. And learning words by their roots actually influences you to learn words in this manner. So you do want to look at learning words like this. Um, I'm going to put this up so that you can see it and maybe, uh, you know, screenshot a part of it or so. But there's a book called Word Power Made Easy. It's by Norman Lewis. I believe it's like 300 rupees on Amazon. So it's very easy to acquire. And the way that they approach learning words here is by roots. It's a great book for this and it's, even better because it's split as exercises. So there are 42 exercises and each one takes like 20 to 30 minutes. So even if the main thing you just do is that, you have ensured that you're gonna learn a big chunk of words and you're gonna learn words that are interesting and somewhat challenging, right? So that's something that you do want to look at. Uh, if you take a look at the, the right-hand column, again, we have loquio or log, which is to speak. Again, this word comes from Greek, uh, the Greek, word for speak the greek verb for speaking was logos so we can see how that links uh, a little bit and once again right like a monologue one person talking a dialogue two people talking right a loquacious person is one who talks a lot somebody who is grand eloquent or magniloquent like magnify is somebody who talks you know uh, let's to use who talks I don't want to say shit because that's not that's that's probably not the, the most polite way to say it. But it's somebody who, who has a lot of big talk, you know, somebody who says things that are not necessarily true, somebody who tends to exaggerate, uh, makes things bigger than they are, right? A soliloquy, so solo is the self. A soliloquy is talking to oneself. What is somniloquy? What's the word for lack of sleep now? Lack of sleep, you may know it as insomnia. So we now have something similar, sleep, and we know that this is about speaking. So somniloquy is to talk in one sleep. So this is how, you know, you can get partial knowledge to help you learn more things, help you make more connections. And rather than learning a list of words, you're making a web of words. And that's really much, much more effective. That's really what you want to try to get at doing, right? Another way that you can learn more words, another way that you can get better at your vocab is, of course, through the aforementioned flashcards. Now, 
the flashcards are very similar to a word list. You have a word and then you have the meaning of that word. So how is, why is it better? Why does it work at all? The reason why the flashcards work is because they add a sense of context to the images that are provided to you, right? So let's take a look at these two words here. You have the word chicanery, which technically means trickery or deception. Cool. Uh, how are you going to remember that? It's not necessarily the easiest word to remember. Maybe you watch Formula One and you're familiar with chicanes. Um, you know, the, the, the way that you navigate a chicane has a lot to do with, you know, sort of sliding back and forth. So maybe, you know, that might spark something with, to do with trickery or deception. But yeah, we have an image to go along with it. So this woman says, this is not coffee. It's all chicory. Right. And chicory is essentially something that keeps coffee dry, but it also adds weight to the coffee. So you can be kind of cheated out of, uh, you know, the coffee that you have. So really what's happened here is that this person has cheated this woman with some trickery or this, some deception with some chicanery. And we have her saying that this is not coffee. It's all chicory. And that, and that, that the association by sound helps you remember the situation better. Another good example of this is the one on the right. We have the word lassitude. Now, lassitude means lethargy or sluggishness. But now if you think of this as the post-lunch lassie attitude, and you have this picture of you know, this Harbhajan Singh lookalike, um, you know, chilling at the end of his retirement. And, um, you know, um, yeah, just having a lassie after lunch. So it's the, the post-lunch lassie attitude. So what is the lassie attitude? It's the lassitude. Right? And that gives you a sense of something that would touch upon lethargy or sluggishness. Right? So this is a way to think about learning words that puts you really in the middle of getting at what the context is rather than simply trying to learn the word for the sake of learning words. Right? I'm going to take a few more questions, but I'm going to go, go by it quickly so that we can finish all of the content and then come back to any last questions that you might have. All right, so somebody says, I have two years left for the GRE. When should I start preparing for the GRE so that I have sufficient time and things would be done in a systematic way? I would say that some of the stuff related to vocabulary, you could probably start thinking about it right now. The best day to start preparing vocab is yesterday, right? So that's the second best day to start preparing vocab is today. So with vocab, you can certainly think about it, right? At least think about general things that might help increase your vocabulary. But actually preparing for the exam and, you know, doing questions in full flow, if you have so much time on hand, you can probably start like three months before, but even three months is a lot of time. Still good to have that kind of time, right? So why not? Um, somebody asks, are there breaks in between each section? Good question. Um, so there, are, there is a break of just one minute in between each section. Um, but at the midway point, so once you're done with three out of the six total parts of the exam, the essay plus two sections, um, so for a total of three, you get a 10 minute break, right? So that's a good opportunity for you to like actually sort of really reset your mind, maybe even like step out of the room, go to the bathroom, just walk around a little bit, you know, if you're the kind of person who likes to do that, um, that's a good point to do that. Otherwise, there's just a minute break. Something else that you can do, um, I wouldn't outright recommend this unless you're very comfortable with doing it, is that if you take the section that you're better at, right? So let's assume that that's quant, right? Because most, for most students, it is quant. May not be the case for you, but then you can always flip this the other way around. Now, if you're done with all the questions in the quant section and you still have four minutes to go, there's no obligation for you to hit next. You can just sit for four minutes and you now have a four minute break, right? So that's something you can do. Generally, I would still recommend using those four minutes to go back to questions that you're unsure of and maybe trying to see whether you want to change your answer or not, or just making sure that you've put down an answer for everything. But if you have already done all of that, then why not? Um, I've heard that the words that will come in an exam will be new words, even though we learn a thousand words or more what to do. Um, I'm not sure what you've asked here. So maybe if you rephrase that, I can get to it at the end of the, at the class, at the end of the webinar. Uh, when is the best time to take up the GRE exam to apply for fall semester 2021? I would say maybe like summer 2020, 
give yourself some time after you're done with your exams in 2020 and then you have a couple of months to prepare for the GRE and then you could probably take it around then. Is it good to give the exam in November? It is, it honestly doesn't matter, right? I took the exam in November. So if you think that gives you good luck, maybe go for it. Um, but uh, there, it really doesn't make a difference. What you're really looking at is, you know, it depends on when you want to actually go to university, right? That's, that's really it. You just need to take the exam at some point before you have to send your application. In. As long as you do that, you're good to go, right? Anyway is really fine on that front. All right, let me move now to the questions that were asked on the chat. All right. So, um, will we be getting a copy of this PowerPoint? You'll not be getting a copy of the PowerPoint, but the, the presentation will be made available to you, uh, you know, on a YouTube video, right? How many hours to prepare per day and how many days per week? I'm also a bit lazy. We will answer this question right at the end. The good news for you, just so that you have some good news for now, is that you know I'm not gonna tell you to prepare like four hours a day or something like that, right? Honestly, anything over two hours a day, I feel is overkill, right? So we can even cap it at that point. Uh, I have two years left for the GRE. Okay, you've already asked this question. Somebody tells me that Kronos is not a god, he's a titan. You know what, I think you're actually right. Um, I used to have some knowledge of Greek mythology, but but I think you're right on this. I think that. You know, of course, we can, we can have our discussion on the distinction, right, between gods and titans, but I will bow to your knowledge on that. Yes, yeah, so, so there, I think, you know, all of you have learned something now, right? Uh, Kronos is actually a titan. All right. Language always goes through transitions. And if we have a look at the GRE vocab words of 1950s and the ones that are in vogue now, there would be a colossal difference. That's a very good point. I do like that. Uh, so it's quite challenging for a student to rely on the well-professed jargon available on the market. Now. I won't say that, okay, so I don't see a question here, but I do have something to say regarding this, right? That um, this is true, things do change, but they don't change so quickly that, uh, you know, that what was used at the start of this decade is suddenly going to be totally out of fashion, right? Yes, it's changed a lot since the 1950s, but things haven't changed a lot since say 2010. So don't worry about it too much. The language that you grew up with or the language that you may have seen in academic papers or in highbrow writing around, you know, on the internet is, has mostly largely remained fairly similar. So it's something that you shouldn't worry about too much. Uh, you know, to add to that as well, the people who are in charge of the GRE are mostly old white men and they really don't want to change this very much. So they only change begrudgingly. So don't worry about that too much, right? I want to learn GRE words. Could you please suggest websites or apps? Uh, the book that I've suggested is probably the best way to go about it. Um, you know, we also have words that we have on our website and you can get access to our flashcards, which as you've seen, work in the way that they do. So those are sources that you can check out. Um, you know, due to internet connection, I add with the seminar now, can you share the slides? We do not share the slides but you can get access to the entire video uh, you know, on YouTube once it's uploaded. What is the role of work experience in one's profile? What does, does it make a profile strong? It does up to a point, but that is, that's actually a very general question and it is vastly dependent on the program that you're applying to and the university that you're applying to. So I would really recommend that you check this up with the universities that you're trying to apply to, right? Uh, how many words do we need for the GRE? Once again, I said there's no fixed amount of words, but you know, I would say that for your own peace of mind, if you can do like a thousand, that should, you should feel pretty good about that, right? But you know, you can't stop at a thousand, right? That's, that's why I don't like setting a, 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 you know, a number because doing less than that number is not inherently a bad thing. And even doing more than that number doesn't necessarily guarantee you, uh, you know, a benefit to your score. So that's why, you know, don't think about it as a fixed number, right? Are these flashcards available? So there's a selection of them available, uh, you know, um, on our website for free. You can even buy the entire set of flashcards and I don't think it's very expensive, uh, but I'm not sure how you buy it again. Can I attempt any section at any time or is it at a particular order so that when one section gets over, the next one gets unlocked? It is the latter. 
you are given the order of sections. However, uh, the questions within a section, you can choose how, what order you want to attempt. Them. How many hours can I give per day if I have a month to go? Well, the number of hours you can give per day is the number of hours you can give per day, right? Depending on what your target is, depending on, you know, what, what you're looking to aim at, one hour a day may be enough and three hours may not be enough. But like I said, I would not recommend studying more than two hours a day, even if you're, you know, coming to the last month of your prep. When is the best time to take it for a fall 2020 admit? So for, uh, for fall 2020, as long as you take it anytime before November or December, it should be fine. There's no difference if you take it in September, you take it in November. What, would, what you really want to look at is what would work for you based on uh, when you're free. Can you share a 30 day study plan or something like that that we can follow? So I will discuss the generic points of a study plan, but the amount of time dedicated to like one topic or one question is, has to be something that is based on your ability. However, yes, uh, uh, the generic sense of what you want to do that we will touch upon. Uh, what books would you prefer? How many words required? We have already, these questions have already been asked. Uh, I have a big problem with English. How can I overcome? So like we said, right, it's, it's just a matter of understanding the techniques and working on your vocab. And we've spoken about vocab. Uh, I'm planning to take the GRE in September, but I haven't started preparation. Is it too late? Uh, it's not too late. But if you can wait till maybe the end of September or the start of October, that, that would probably be better. Unless you have a pressing reason, with, which means that you have to take it at the start of September, maybe giving yourself a couple of months is a good idea. Um, only GRE marks are not considered during selection, even the profile matters. How do we build up the resume? That's kind of outside the scope of this discussion, but essentially, you know, uh, what I would say is the most generic piece of advice on this is that, you know, pick things that you're passionate about and do them, do them a lot. Uh, many words have different shades like Google, which was a noun in the beginning, but it has shown a transition to a verb. So when you see many words on the GRE with that aspect, how do you deal with that? Um, there are verbs that have, uh, sorry, words that have kind of changed in the manner that they've been used in, in the last 15 years are not words that will be tested very often on the GRE. So don't worry too much about that. It's, it's an interesting question. It's, it's good to think about it, you know, from the point of view of vocab in general, but I would say don't worry about it for the GRE itself. Is it possible to revisit past sections after one has moved on to the next section? No, you can only move around within a section. Once you're done with the section, you're kind of locked into that. Um, is there a pattern in the increase in score from the first diagnostic mock test to the main exam? That would be totally dependent on your, um, on the effort that you put in, on the, the application that you put in and how you approach the test. I would say that generally, yes, if from the start of your prep to where you end, you will see some, some gains simply because you're better at thinking about the test. But that is something that's really much more in your hands than something for me to say. Uh, we've already talked about the books, right? That ultimately, you know, um, a book is not necessarily the best source, right? The one book that we can talk about, of course, is Word Power Made Easy, and that's a good book for vocabulary. But regarding the conceptual matter, right? The conceptual matter is very straightforward and you're best off just signing up for some course to, to help you think about that, right? All right. Let's move on, right? So that we can, you know, at least wrap things up by nine, right? Let's put a hard stop at nine. Um, and then we can make sure that we're at least done by that point. Now we spoke about word lists, right? And you know, why word, like why learning words by a list is not necessarily a good idea. And I will come back to that point uh, that, you know, word lists are not a very good idea. However, there's one way of listing or grouping words that does actually have some value. And uh, what that is, is to group words based on say the intensity of meaning or the connotation that they have. Uh, one example could be that a, um, that a crevice is uh, narrower than a gorge, which is narrower than a canyon, 
which is narrower than a val valley, right? And they're all kind, they kind of mean the same thing, you know, it's like elevated regions in between which there is water that flows. Kind of the same idea, but like one refers to something that's much more narrow, a crevice is much more narrow, a gorge is wider, a canyon is wider still, a valley is much wider, right? So, uh, you know, that's something worth thinking about. Another thing would be the example that we have over here. Uh, all of these words mean the same thing. So to be profligate, to be prodigal, to be extravagant, to be spendthrift, and to be unstinting, all mean to spend a lot of money. But the connotation is different. And it's useful to learn these words as a list because you can kind of group them together. They all mean the same thing. But somebody who's described as a profligate, that word has an extremely negative connotation. It's associated with having no self-control. In fact, um, you know, it's not really used very common. Like it's not used in that context anymore. But, uh, you know, the word profligate started out as the male equivalent for slut. But that was like at least 500 years ago. Right? So now it's just used as somebody who spends a lot of money and is associated with not having self-control. Uh, we've been kind of rude to people, uh, to certain groups of people in our history, haven't we? But okay, right? Um, so profligate, somebody who spends a lot of money, but it's negative. Somebody who's prodigal, spends a lot of money, it is negative, but not as negative as prodigal. Somebody who's, who spends extravagantly or somebody who is extravagant, see, that could have a negative connotation. That could also have a positive connotation that could have a neutral connotation. We'd have to see more of the sentence to know what it is. Somebody who's a spendthrift spends a lot of money, but it's, it is the kind of person who spends a lot of money in a situation where it is encouraged to spend a lot of money. So, you know, when it comes to taking care of your family, you should be a spendthrift. That, that would be, you know, a way of putting it, uh, of putting it right? That, that yes, you're spending a lot, but it's a good idea that you are. To be unstinting is to spare no expense. It's to like pull out all the stops and spend everything that you got. But in a positive way, to achieve something positive or to achieve something that is nice or happy as opposed to being looked at as bad spending, right? So whatever, this ties back in some sense to what we looked at before when it came to learning words. You want the words that you learn in some way to be connected to each other, to have some kind of link. Only then, will it make sense as to what kind of context you would expect to find these words, right? And that's really the best way to go about it. All right. Now, the final thing that you want to do in order to learn vocab, and, you know, I see that some of you have asked questions uh, about preparing for the GRE on a long-term basis. So this will be particularly useful for you, but it will be useful for everyone, actually. Uh, you know, we talk about learning a number of words and I've been so reluctant to commit to saying any number of words. And, you know, here's the reason why. It depends on what your starting point is and what are the kinds of words that you've come across in your life already. A lot of the GRE words might sound very daunting, but, you know, when, when I look at them, I think about like, like I said, right, I like history, I like politics, I like philosophy, and I'm on a lot of Facebook groups that discuss these things. And the kind of words that get tested as GRE words, I see a bunch of them being thrown around in casual discussions of people having Facebook arguments. Like people have Facebook arguments with those words. So I'm lucky I get exposed to that kind of vocab automatically. That, that's something that worked out well for me. So, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that your environment contributes to what kind of words you end up knowing. And the deeper you go into any subject, the more complex the, the language used becomes, right? So the more you, you, you understand any subject, the more complicated the ideas are going to be in that subject. And the more complicated the ideas are gonna be in that subject, the more they're gonna require more complicated words. So you automatically start to come up with, uh, you start to you know, come across words that are more complex and express some very specific, very unique ideas. And that's really what it is that you know, you're looking to do. So, if you have a passion, double down on it, right? Explore your passion. And even if your passion is playing video games, you know, like I've learned a lot of words from playing video games. I've learned like, uh, like you know, when I was young, right? I'd play a role playing game and, you know, they talk about like agility and vitality. And I'm like, well, I don't know what those things are. And I look them up, right? And, you know, and, and of course now, you know, word like agility is a little bit more straightforward, but you're always going to come across new words 
as long as you double down on the fields that you're interested in, right? Whether it's books, movies, video games, how you, the kind of music that you listen to, talking about music, sports, analyzing sports, anything that you might be passionate about, look up stuff about it, right? The biggest advantages of doing this is that when you learn words in this way, they come with context. You're not learning them as learning the definition of something. You're seeing it being actually used in a context. And the most important part is that you actually give a crap about the context. This is something that you're already interested in. So you're actually probably going to go and look it up. You're actually going to think about the manner in which this word would be used. Right. And it ends up being the most effective way in which we learn words. Once again, this is the most similar to the manner in which we acquire words as children. The challenges are that this is really a, a, a subtle, uh, a passive process in a way. This is something that should be happening in the background while the more active vocab prep that you do is, you know, learning words through roots or, you know, uh, organizing words by intensity and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's something that you can't just say in 30 days, I'm going to change my entire environment and I'm going to learn, you know, a buttload of words. It's not going to happen that way. Right. So that's something you've got to look out for. The other thing is that, you know, maybe the content that you read and watch may not be that enriching. Right. There's always the possibility that that happens. But in general, if you get deep into any topic, you will start to hit content that is enriching. Right. A good example of this would be, you know, I like watching TV shows. I still try to watch a lot of TV, but, uh, you know, work gets in the way and, you know, I'm just busy with other stuff. But, you know, I watch a lot of TV and then I came across this term called a bottle episode. In fact, one of my favorite TV shows did a whole episode where they made fun of the concept of a bottle episode. And I was like, well, what the hell is a bottle episode? So I looked it up and, you know, what I learned is that it's a common practice in TV shows to like, um, you know, to like overspend early on. And then they have to have an episode that is made very cheaply so that they can get back into budgeting. And this is likened into trying to like fit those replica ships into the glass bottles. And from there we get the term bottle episode. Now this is not a GRE word. This is not something that's going to be tested on the GRE, but it's a word and an idea that I would have never come across if I were not interested or if I were not simply alert and interested when things that were related to what I was passionate about came up, right? So really that's what you want to do. You want to put your, take the things that you like and double down on them, right? Um, another example on this front, you know, I know that I've given a lot of examples and taken a lot of your time and I really appreciate all of you for staying on. Uh, but another example here would be like, if you've read the Harry Potter books or you watched the Harry Potter movies, um, you know, I remember that when I watched uh, when I read the, the third book, right, and you know, I'm going to give you spoilers because it's been long enough, but uh, one of the characters turns out to be a werewolf. And I remember being absolutely shocked. You know, I was like, oh, wow, this dude was a werewolf. That was nuts. That's, that's not something I expected at all. But now when I go back and read that book, I'm like, well, the guy's name is Lupin. The guy's name is Remus Lupin. And, you know, the word lupine, just like canine is to do with dogs, lupine is to do with wolves. Um, and even the first name Remus, uh, you know, the, the mythological tale goes that the founders of the city of Rome were two brothers named Romulus and Remus. So this guy's name is Remus Lupin. Um, and, you know, Remus uh, suffers a lot of misfortune in, in the Roman mythology. And so does this person, this Remus Lupin suffers a lot of misfortune in the Harry Potter book. So it's, it's almost like all of the stuff was being foreshadowed to me. And now that I have, you know, like a bit more awareness, I'm able to see it. I'm able to see how these names came about and, and where they come from, right? So, you know, like, um, like another Harry Potter reference, right? So you say Leviosa to, to make something levitate, right? So to make something rise up, right? So you may start to notice that, that you know, there's an opportunity to learn words and word roots wherever you go, right? They come up everywhere in the environment around you. You just have to open yourself up to it. All right. So the last thing that we want to discuss is to come up with an actual plan, right? How do we make this plan? What, is the, what are the factors that we have to take into consideration while uh, devising a 30-day plan? 
Now, the first thing is that I promised you that I wouldn't say more than two hours a day. We've already said 30 to 45 minutes for vocab, right? So now let's say that you only really have one minute 15 to one and a half hours in a day left, right? So what are we going to do in that time? The goal is not to solve questions in bulk. You're not trying to simply solve as many questions as possible and, you know, uh, solve all the questions out there because you will run out of questions. The goal is to solve a fixed number of questions from which you can actually do good analysis. So what is the approach that you want to take? Really, you don't need to solve more than 20 questions a day, right? I would put a cap at 20, right? Uh, some days you can maybe do 40, right? Um, or actually, you know what, let's not say 40. Let's say, let's stick to 20. Some days you can do a mock test and that's gonna be many more questions, right? That's obviously gonna be a bigger, chunkier day. But outside of that, right, on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't really need to do more than 20 questions, right? Maybe you could say that you'll do a verbal section one day, a quant section the next, right? So maybe three days of verbal, three days of quant. Actually, let's scratch that. If you find that you're weaker in a section, four days of that, two days of the one that you're stronger in, right? So if you're stronger in verbal and weaker in quant, two days of verbal, four days of quant, or vice versa, right? But not more than 20 questions a day. Now, if you're going to solve 20 questions a day, we've already talked about this. You have to set a timer right? You have to know that you're going to take a fixed amount of time. If all those 20 questions are going to be reading comprehension, maybe set yourself 40 minutes. If all those 20 questions are going to be sentence equivalents, just set yourself 20 minutes, right? But you have to set a timer based on what you're looking to meet in terms of the actual time stipulations on the GR, right? So you've got to get that down. Now, you, now the other benefit to this is that it's going to take you less time, right? You're going to be able to make sure that you do all of this in one, one shot, in one bunch, right? And let's say you do reading comprehension questions. Those take longer than any category of question that I'm aware of. I don't think there's anything in quant that is a category that takes longer than two minutes per question. So, you know, let's call that, let's say reading comprehension, and it takes you 40 minutes. So you, you, you did questions for 40 minutes. You then look up the answers and you know tally what you got. Let's say that takes another 10 minutes. So that's 50, right? So what, we have now the 40 minutes to go, right? For an hour and a half. Now, from those 20 questions, let's say you got 10 right and 10 wrong, right? You didn't have the best day. You didn't have the worst day either, but you didn't have the best day and you got 10 wrong. Now, for each one of those wrong questions, you need to take a look at why that answer was wrong. Remember that we spoke about this before. You're trying to eliminate answers. This means that you want to make sure that you don't understand why the right answer is right, but why each of the wrong answers are wrong. That is the clarity that you want to get to. Right? You want to know why every single wrong answer. So, so if you pick A and the right answer is C, it's not enough to look at the answer key and say, okay, C is the right answer, or C is right because of this reason. No, that's not enough. You need to know why A is wrong, why B is wrong, why D is wrong, why E is wrong. You need to know that, right? And that's really what we call doing proper analysis. So maybe it took you 40 minutes to do the questions, but I guarantee you that it'll take you another 40 minutes to analyze where you went wrong. And this adds up to an hour and a half. So an hour and a half of this and 30 to 45 minutes of vocab. Okay, so maybe I cheated a bit, two hours, 15 minutes at tops. But really, you don't want to push it past that, right? Beyond this, even your brain doesn't necessarily process information as well. And think about it like this. If you did 50 questions and then you try to do this analysis, you're not going to remember what you did on each one of those 50 questions. If you do just 20 questions, each question is memorable to you. Each question, when you see it and you realize that you made a mistake, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, I remember doing this question. I remember what I was confused by. I remember how I went about it. That then lets you analyze what you need to change in your approach. If you just do a large bulk of questions, you're not going to get to that place, right? So on a day-to-day -day basis, what is it that you're looking to do? You're really looking to do not more than 20 questions a day. You're not really looking to study more than like two hours in total. It's, you know, about 30 to 40 minutes of solving questions and then another 30 to 40 minutes of analyzing what it is that you solved. That is why you want to go about it. You can decide how many days for verbal and quant based on your strengths and weaknesses. Generally, spend more days where you're weak, right? 
But that is overall the kind of study plan that you would want to follow, right? It is not about trying to reach for the moon and like, you know, get to this ridiculous number of questions and really burn yourself up. It's about getting that general level of comfort and, um, and, and expertise to be habituated to solve GRE questions. Basically, that's what you want to be. You want to be habituated to solve GRE questions. You want it, you want it to be the natural process that you, you see these kinds of questions, you're comfortable with them, you're used to looking at them, you're even used to solving them with time management stipulations in place. And that is the ultimate approach that you need to follow. All right. I'm going to take a look at the chat to see, you know, what final questions have come up, but please don't send any more because we've run well over time. So I'm just going to see if there's anything else that, uh, you know, that, that's come up that was worth, worth bringing up. So yes, yeah, Romulus and Remus were raised by wolves. Did I not mention that? Well, that, that kind of weakened my point then. Thanks for putting that up. Yeah, Romulus and Remus were raised by wolves and Remus Lupin then, you know, fits in as a name that matches being a wolf, right? So, so you start to see how these connections are made, uh, you know, sort of in a more straightforward fashion. Let's see if there's any questions that have come in on the end. Uh, so the deadline, is it good to give the exam in November? Actually, the deadlines of some universities are till November 15. So see, again, if you know which unis you're applying to and you know that their deadlines are early, then you want to apply before that deadline, right? But if you know, so it's really dependent on when the deadlines are. What I would say, however, is that, you know, some unis have early applications by, by November 15th, but it's not necessary that you send in an early application. Most American universities and, uh, you know, certainly this is true for Canada and Europe. The admission, like you have to send in your admission generally by the 31st of December for whatever, for, you know, off a given year to start in the fall of the next year, right? That's generally the case. With Canada and Europe, it's even later. But, um, you know, do your research there, right? Every university is not the same. And like we said, right, the more knowledge that you have going into what you're doing at the start, the better a sense you will have going out, right? Thank, thank you all, right, for uh, staying for an hour and a half. I appreciate all of you taking this time out of your day, uh, you know, to take on whatever advice that you've uh, gotten here. And I hope that you all use it and do great on the GRE. Um, just to, you know, sort of let you know, right? So we do have uh, essentially a discount on our GRE course. It says 50% off. That's, oh, that's, that's not right. That's, uh, it's 40% it's off. My bad, uh, but really $50 off. So the actual price is $125. And if you use the code special 50, you know, it's being offered at just 75. So, you know, I did recommend joining a course. You know, I, I would definitely recommend Crack Verbal. Why would I not? I teach here, right? So take care, have a great one, right? Um, you know, remember the code special 50 if you want to sign up. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Have a great night.